Hello, my name is Adam. In this video, we are going to learn how to make Minesweeper in Unity. Minesweeper is a single player puzzle game that originated in the 1960s. The objective of the game is to clear a rectangular board containing hidden mines or bombs without detonating any of them. The board provides clues about the number of mines surrounding each cell. Minesweeper is all about algorithms and data structures, so this will be a great test for your skills as a programmer. Even if you are new to programming, you might learn a few things along the way. If you need help at any point in the tutorial, feel free to join our Discord community where we can offer direct help. There's a link in the description of the video. Please consider subscribing to the channel to support the amount of effort it takes to create a video like this one. It would mean a lot to me and it really helps drive the growth of my channel. Thank you. Enjoy the video. All right, let's jump right in and start a new project using the Unity Hub. For some of you, this might not look familiar because they actually just released Unity Hub 3.0 at the time of this video. Same thing though, we can go ahead and create a new project using the button in the top right corner. From here at the very top, we can choose the version of Unity we want to use. So in this case, I'm going to be using Unity 2020.3. However, for this particular tutorial, it won't really matter which version you're using. We're not going to use any fancy features of Unity that might only be available in one version. So pick whichever version. We're going to select the 2D template here since this is going to be a 2D game. On the right, we can name our project. So I'm just going to call this Minesweeper and choose wherever you would like to save your project. Go ahead and click Create. This might take a couple minutes to initialize, so we'll pick it back up as soon as it's finished. Once your project finishes initializing, you should see something like this. And before we do anything, I actually want to import a few sprites that we will use throughout our game. Feel free to use your own custom sprites if you want, but also you can use the same sprites I'll be using by downloading them. There's going to be a link in the description of the video for GitHub, which will take you to this page here. This has the entire project where you can download the whole thing. So if you go to this code button, we can download this as a zip. Let's go ahead and open this up. If we go to our downloads folder, I can extract all of this somewhere. And then within this, we can find our sprites. And once again, this is actually the entire project. So you're going to want to look specifically for the sprites. So assets, sprites, and then just pick out the PNGs here. So I'm going to drag these into our project real quick. Go ahead and just take all those and drag them in. And close that. And I'm going to organize these into a new folder. So let's create a folder called sprites and move all of those into there. And from here, we just need to change a few settings on these assets. So as we click on one of these, we can see all of the import settings for this particular file. We can actually select all of them at once and change them because they're all going to have the exact same settings. The first, what we want to do is change our pixels per unit to 16. This is going to be specific to the assets that you use. So if you're creating your own custom assets, it might be different. All of these assets are 16 by 16 tiles. And so our pixels per unit will be 16. We're going to change the wrap mode. Actually, we can keep the wrap mode at clamp. Doesn't matter for this game. We're gonna change the filter mode to point though. Since these are more sort of pixel-based graphics, we don't want any of the filtering, which is gonna distort that look and style. And then from here, we can probably just change the max size to 32 since they're only 16 by 16 images. And format or compression, we can go to none, but these ones aren't as important. Mostly just pixels per unit in the filtering mode here. And that is it in terms of importing our sprites. All right, next, we just need to do a little bit of scene setup before we can begin scripting our game. First, I'm going to go to our scenes folder here and Unity provides us a sample scene to work with. I'm going to just rename this to Minesweeper. We'll reload. In the left here is our hierarchy where we can see all of the game objects that exist within this scene. If we click on one of those, then on the right is our inspector where we can see the components that exist on that game object. So by default, Unity gives us a camera game object with a camera component and an audio listener. All I really want to do here is change a couple properties on this. Um, so for one, I'm going to change the background color. 
I'm going to use like a sort of pastel blue-ish kind of light blue color. Um, this is the hexadecimal for that, but feel free to completely customize this however you want. It is completely up to you. And then from here, I also want to just change the size of our camera from 5 to maybe about 10. As I change this, you can see this white outline getting um, changing in size. So this is basically going to give us more or less space to work with for our game. And if you don't see this outline, make sure you have gizmos turned on up here. So I'm going to set this to about 10. That should give us plenty of space to work with for our game. Um, depending on how big you plan on making your Minesweeper board, you may need to adjust this accordingly. But once again, feel free to just kind of customize it, see what works and looks best for you. From here, I also want to create a tile map. So we can right click in our hierarchy, go to 2D object, tile map and we're going to choose the rectangular tile map. This is going to create a grid as well as our tile map here. And we don't really need to change any of the properties on this object. We just need the tile map and we're good to go. So that is actually all we need to do for our scene setup. And now we can begin jumping right into the code. The entire game of Minesweeper takes place on a grid. And so we need to somehow represent that grid in our code. Now we have our grid here and our tile map, but that's going to be used for rendering purposes, for drawing and actually displaying the data. And so it's very common within software development that you separate the presentation from the data itself. So our tile map has to do with the presentation of the data, but we need our own code to represent what that data is. If we think about each of these individual cells within a within Minesweeper, we have to think about what is the data associated with these cells. So the cell could either be empty, it could have a number, or it could be a mine. And then there are maybe other properties like has the cell been revealed or is it still hidden? All right. We need to create a data structure that's going to represent one of these individual cells. And once we have that data structure, we can form a two dimensional array of all of that data, and that will represent the state of our game. Let's go ahead and create a brand new script to represent that data structure. Let's right click in our project panel, go to create C sharp script, and I'm going to call this a cell. So this is going to be our data structure for an individual cell within our board. And actually, I want to put this into a folder called scripts just to keep everything organized. So let's move that. Go ahead and open this up. Let me turn off my copilot here. So by default, Unity creates us a class that inherits from Mono behavior. And there's a couple of functions that are commonly used. We actually don't need those for this. We can get rid of this because we want to treat this as a custom data structure. So we actually can get rid of the mono behavior there. We're going to change this from a class to a struct. And then from here, we can start to um, define different properties that make up our cell. So think of this as a data structure. That's why it's called a struct. One of the things we need to determine is what type of cell is it? Is it empty? Is it a mine? Or is it a number? Those are sort of the three types of cells that we'll have. One of the ways we can define this classification is via something called an enum. We can call this enum just type. Within an enum, you will list out the different um, values you want to associate with this type. So we can have empty is one type. We can have mine as another type. And lastly, number will be the third type. So there is our enum. Now we just need to create a property or a field that actually is that type. All right, now let's think about what other data do we need to represent an individual cell? Well, we also need to know the position of the cell within the board. All right, and so that's going to be represented via a vector three int. And we can just call this position. So vector three is going to have an X, Y, and Z coordinate. And then an int, they're going to be 
all three of those will be integers instead of the normal vector three are all floats. When you're working with a tile map, we use vector three int. The other thing we might need for our data structure here is if it is a number, how, what number is it? Is it one? Is it two? Is it five? Right? So we might need to have a integer that represents what that number is. Finally, we need a couple variables to determine sort of the state of the cell based on the user's interactions, such as, for example, has the cell been revealed or has it not been clicked yet? Also, the user is able to flag a cell. So has the cell been flagged? And finally, if it's a mine and you click on it, well, then it should explode. So we might want a property to indicate that this cell has exploded. And so all of three of those were Booleans, Boolean being a true or false value. And we can update these as we need to um, for the state of our game, but that will happen elsewhere. So this initially is the basic data structure that's going to be used throughout our entire game. Very important. Next, we need to create a new script that's going to handle updating our game board. In, in other words, a script that's going to actually draw all the tiles on our tile map according to all of our cell data. And if you remember earlier, I talked about the separation of the presentation and the data itself, or the game, the, there will be a separation of the game logic and data and then the presentation. And so we're gonna first focus on the presentation because we can't really test our game logic until we're able to actually visualize all of that. Until we can render and draw something on our tile map, we can't really verify that our logic is correct. Or we could, but it would be a little bit harder. Let's go ahead and focus on our presentation first. Before we can actually write the script for that, we need to create some tile assets. To render something on a tile map, you need a tile asset, which is not just a sprite. A tile asset includes a sprite or references a sprite, but it also has other data too. So if we go to click our tile map in our hierarchy, you should see this and go to make sure we're on our scene view here. You should see this little pop up. This is open tile palette. Let's go ahead and click that. And from here, we can create a new palette. Think of a palette, like maybe if you were painting something, you might have a palette of colors that you can choose from. This is very similar where we're gonna create a palette of tiles that we can then draw onto our board here. Let's create a new palette. I'm just gonna simply call this tiles. And let's choose the folder where we wanna save this. So I'm gonna go to assets and I'm gonna create a new folder called tiles. I'm gonna select that. We have our palette now, and here we can drag in all of our sprites to automatically generate the tile assets. Let's go to our sprites folder. Let's select all of these sprites and drag them into our palette here. We need to choose where to save these new assets that are going to be generated. So our tiles folder again, select that. Here we can see all of our tiles show up. We also can go to our tiles folder where you can see all of these show up. And they might just feel like sprites to you, but once again, they're not, they're actually a custom asset type. It references a sprite, but it also has other information like color and collider type and so on. And then this tiles here is, this is our actual palette. There, once again, we can open up. Now that we have our tiles, we can actually go ahead and write the script that will decide which tile to draw on our board based on the cell data. Okay, let's create a brand new script. we we'll go to our scripts folder, right click, create C-sharp script. I'm just gonna call this board. It represents our game board. Specifically, we want to add the script to our tile map game object. So we can take the script and drag it into the empty space at the bottom. This is going to uh, run this script as part of this game object. And we specifically want it on this game object because our board script needs to reference this tile map component in order to actually draw things. Let's go ahead and edit this. Once again, Unity generates a class that inherits from mono behavior, a couple functions that are commonly used. We do want it to inherit from mono behavior. It needs to actually. 
but I personally, just as my preference, like to kind of delete delete all this stuff that's not initially used and just start fresh. So for our board here, we need to get a reference to the tile map so we can draw the correct tiles on it according to our um, cell data. So let's create a variable for our tile map. Oh, and to reference a tile map, we need to actually import using unity engine maps. Make sure you've included that. Now we can create a variable for our tile map. For this variable, I actually want to give it a getter with a private setter. Um, so it's basically a public getter, but a private setter. The reason this is important is because our other script later on for our game logic might need to access and read the tile map, but it doesn't need to change or assign or set this value here. Only this class can, can change this uh, value. Um, and so that's why we make it private. So that's why I actually go ahead and do that assignment now. Let's add the function awake, which is a built-in function, built function that Unity provides. This will get called automatically whenever our script sort of initializes on, um, yeah, kind of initializes on the object uh, when, it, when the game runs. And from here we can assign our tile map using the get component function. And we need to specify a type of component we want to get. In this case, tile map. It should match whatever the type you specified for your property is. What this is going to do is it's going to look on the same game object the script is running on. It's going to try to find a component of this type you specified. And if it exists, it will assign it to our variable here. So we can see our tile map component does exist here. If at any point, if you were to get a null reference exception, Commonly, that indicates you maybe are trying to get a reference to something that doesn't exist. So maybe you get component, but if this tile map wasn't here, it wouldn't find it. Tile map would get set to null. And then at any point, if you try to access that null reference, you would get a null reference exception, an error. All right, so from here, now we have our tile map, we can actually go and update it. We're going to create a brand new function to handle all of that logic. And we want to make this a public function because it's going to be called from our core game, like game logic script. Um, the, the core kind of game script will say, hey, game board, you need to be updated now that the state of the game has changed. And so it will call this function. Maybe I'll just call it draw. And we need to pass in all of our cell data so the tile map can update itself accordingly. If you remember earlier, we talked about the cell data being a two dimensional array. We need to declare that. To do that, we can say the type of the array, which is cell. We use our square brackets to indicate it's an array. And then to indicate it's a two dimensional array, we can put a comma in between there. And I'm just going to call this state. So this is essentially our game state which is comprised of all of our cells. Now that we have that, we can loop over it and update our tile map. So to loop over something, we need to get the length of the array. But since this is a two-dimensional array, there's two lengths. There's a length in the uh, x-axis and a length in the y-axis. We can think of those as our width and our height. So to get the width, we can say state.getLength, and we need to pass in our dimension, which are just indexes, so index zero. And then our height will be same thing, but the next index, which is index one. Now from here, we can loop over this pretty standard. We can say for, and normally we would say, usually we use the variable i. Um, I'm gonna actually specifically use x and y because these are basically coordinates. I'm gonna say x equals zero. We're gonna loop until we've hit the end of the dimension. So the end of our width, and we're gonna increment that and then um, same thing for our y. y is less than our height, y plus plus, can't type. So once again, this is basically looping where we start at the very beginning. We're gonna continue iterating upwards until we reach the very end. Same thing in both dimensions. Now from here, we can update our tile map. 
we need to pull out the data for the individual cell at these coordinates, at the current X and Y coordinate. So to do that, we can get a reference to a cell um, and we can say states X, Y. So we're extracting the cell data at the, these specific X, Y coordinates. And that cell has, once again, all of this data here that we'll use to render it. We need to say tile map dot set tile. And we need to pass in a position and the tile we want to render. So for the position, if you remember earlier, we created a position property or field on our cell. So we can just say solid out position. And then we need to figure out the tile we want to render, which there's going to be a lot of logic associated with that. So I'm going to put that into a new function. Maybe that function is called get tile. Um, and we need the function, we need to pass in our cell data to this function so it can determine which tile to render. Now this is giving me an error because we haven't actually created this function yet. So let's go ahead and do that. So it'll be a private function. It's going to return a tile and we're going to say get tile as we called it up here. And we said we wanted to pass in the cell data, so we'll pass in the cell data. All right, and so from here we can determine which tile to render based on um, based on the logic here. So, for example, if the cell has been revealed, we need to return one thing, right? And if our cell has been, if it's not revealed but it's been flagged, well, then we need to return something else. All right. And if it has not been revealed and it has not been flagged, well then else we need to return something else. Okay, so we'll fill all those out, but we don't have the references to our tiles in order to return those. And right, so we need to, let's come back to this function. I'm going to comment this whole function out for a moment here. Um, well, actually, it, it doesn't matter. We'll leave it. Um, we need to declare our tiles up here. So we need to get a reference to all of our, those tile assets that we created earlier. So we need to create some variables for those. These will all be public. They'll be typed as tile, and then we can give them all names. So we have, for example, tile unknown. Um, we have tile empty. We have tile mine, tile exploded. There's a tile for a flag. And then what? Then we have tiles for all the numbers. So we can say maybe num1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, oops, 7. Oh, and I did one too many. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, oh, no, 6, 7, 8. Okay. Take a moment to pause the video and type all that out. Um, but now that we have all these, we can actually finish our function here. Um, although I want to show you something first. I need our code to compile before I can show you. So let me comment this out and let me comment this out just so our code compiles real quick. I just need to get rid of the errors. So it's just temporary. Don't bother doing that. Once this compiles here, notice how you see all of these show up, right? So now that they all show up, we can actually go and assign our reference to each of those assets that we created earlier. So why don't we go ahead and do that? Just drag all of these into their respective fields. Five, six, seven, eight, tile empty, exploded, flag, and mine, and unknown. So now we've we are referencing all of these assets which we will use to render on our tile map via our board script here. All right, let's go back and finish this up. Let's uncomment those. So now that we have those tiles, we just have to figure out which one of these tiles to render based on these different, you know, properties here. So flagged is pretty easy because we just return tile flag. If it has not been revealed and it has not been flagged, well, that means you really haven't interacted with that tile at all and so that's what our unknown tile is it's unknown in that we don't the user doesn't know yet if it's a mine if it's a if it's a empty if it's a number 
it's unknown because I haven't interacted with it yet. Now, if it's revealed, there's actually more logic that needs to take place because then, it, well, if it's revealed, is it an empty tile? Is it a mine? Is it a number? So we might want to separate that logic into a new function as well. Um, so I'm going to create a new function. Also going to return a tile. I'm going to call this get revealed file. And we're going to once again pass in our cell data. And so this is what we'll return here. We're going to call that function and let this function handle all the logic for, um, for the revealed tile. So for the real veal tile, it really just depends on the type of cell. If it's empty, we'll return the empty tile. If it's mine, we'll return the mine tile. And if it's a number, we'll return a number tile, right? So we can actually switch on the cell type. And a switch statement is kind of like an if else, else if, you know, it's kind of like oh, just a sequence of um, if statements here, where we're, we're checking one particular property here and we can verify if this type is the cell type empty, we will return the tile empty. If it is the um, mine type, we will return the tile mine. And finally, if it is the number type, well, in that case, it could be either one through eight. So there needs to be even more logic to figure that out. Just like we did here, I'm gonna actually create a new function for that also going to return a tile i'm going to call this get number tile and then once again i'm passing our cell data and we'll return that here passing our cell data um before we jump down to this if the cell type is neither of these which actually is impossible but this is just maybe a good thing to do anyways we can actually add a default case and in this case i'll just return null so it essentially it says it's not valid all right, for our get number tile, this is going to look very similar to this. We can switch here on the cell number, right? If you remember, we created this number property here, this number field that indicates, you know, how many adjacent mines there are. And so if it, if the case is one, if there's one, then we will return tile num one and so on. We'll do this for all eights, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and eight. All right. And this is giving us an error because we need to make sure we're returning something no matter what the case is. And so that's where we actually need to add our default case in the occurrence that the number is neither of these. And once again, we can just return null because that should never happen. Um, but we need to return something and null is actually a, a completely valid um, option here. So. so feel free once again to pause the video and type all of this up. Um, if you need to also reference the code, it is in GitHub using that same link we used earlier when we downloaded the sprites. But now that this is here, this is done. We're completely done now with our board script. This will never get touched again. Basically, the whole idea is we loop through all of our cell data and we figure out which cell to draw on our board based on all the different data associated with this cell. And it's just a matter of kind of checking like if it's if it's in this state, return this tile. If it's in a different state, return a different tile, so on and so forth. And we just kind of organized all that logic into a few different functions here. Get tile, get revealed tile, and get number tile. That looks good. All right. Now that we've finished our presentation code, we can actually start writing the core game logic. And so that's this is going to actually be our, kind of the main script of our entire game. Let's go ahead and create a brand new script. I'm gonna just call this game. This is basically gonna have all the game logic all in this one script. Um, let's add this script to our, it doesn't really matter where we add it. We can add it either to the tile map. I'm gonna actually just add it to the grid object here since this is kind of the, the, parent, the parent element. 
We just need to make sure it's either on the tile map or the grid because we will need to get a reference to our other script because the game logic will say, hey, board, game board, can you go and update yourself, right? Using that draw function that we created. We've added to our grid game object here. Let's begin editing this. Let's just start simple and get a basic, um, kind of our basic board displaying um, using using all the code we just finished writing. So for our game, we can make this very customizable. So we can add variables um, for you to change how large you want the uh, how large you want the game to be. Um, so we can maybe have a width here, and we can say this is. Maybe by default, it's a 16 by 16 um, game, but feel free to change these. But making these variables, they will show up here in the editor. And so you can customize these however you want. These are essentially just our default values, but their actual values in the editor might be different if you've changed them. We do need to get a reference to that other script we wrote, our board script. That way we can um, call our draw function based on the state of the game. So let's get a reference to this. Oh, this doesn't need to be public. This can just be private. And we will assign that reference in our awake function using get component. Um, this time though, we're gonna say get component in children because our board script is not on the same game object as our game script here. It's on one of the child game objects, right? So we say get component in children. From here, we might want to add our start function. So this is a function Unity calls automatically the very first frame that this script is enabled and running on a game object. And our start function should just start a new game. So maybe we have a different function called new game, which will be called from start. And the reason why we're having a new function for this is because we're going to call it in other places as well. We want to initially call it when the game starts, but we also want to call new game, um, you know, every time you play again and, and things like that. Our new game function can go ahead and kind of initially create all the data for our game. So if you remember here in our draw function for our board, there's this 2D array of cells. We need to create that 2D array of cells. But actually we need a variable for that. Go ahead and create another variable and we're gonna call this state. This is the actual data. It's getting stored in our game class. And when we start a new game, we can reinitialize the states there. So we can say state equals new cell. Um, and we can pass in the width and height that we've specified here for our 2D array. Um, now from here, we can basically go and we need to kind of generate all of the cell data. Um, there's gonna be a few different aspects to generating our game. So there's gonna be generating the cells initially, then it's gonna be generating the mines. And then once the mines are generated, we can figure out all of the numbers for each of our cells. Um, but for now, let's just focus on getting some basic cells in place. So we're going to have a 2D loop here. Um, we're going to do this a lot, so I'm not going to explain it every time, but we're going to have, we're going to, we, we're going to need to loop over our two dimensional array. We're going to see this, basically see this exact same code written a few different times. Very standard, just kind of creating a for loop, some for loops here to iterate over our array. Oh, and I made a mistake here. Y equals zero. Y is less than height. Y plus plus. X, Y, and then for each of our um, cells in our two-dimensional array, let's go ahead and create a brand new cell. We can create a new cell and let's assign some um, data to this. So for one, we want to assign the position. The position here is going to be a new vector three int using just whatever these coordinates are x, y, and then z is always going to be zero. Ideally, these would be a vector two int, but tile maps, when you're working with a tile map, they expect a vector three int, so that's why we're using it. But we can just basically ignore the, the z axis. We should also set the type of the cell. 
which initially for all of them will just be empty. We will then go back and do another pass where we generate the mines and then do a third pass where we generate the numbers. So initially they'll all be empty and then we'll set them to the other type as needed. And now that we have our cell, kind of our initial cell data, we can just assign this into our array. And that's it. We need to call this function from new game. So we'll generate the cells. And then after we've done all the generation, we can update our board, all right? So now we have, we already established a reference to our game board. So we can say board.draw and we can pass in our data here. Once again, this is that custom function we made. If you're not able to access this, it's probably because you didn't make this public. Make sure this is public. Let's go ahead and test this out. Great, so we can see all of our cells, they show up. We've got our 2D array. It's off center, we're gonna fix that in a moment. But let's play around with something else. Let's change our width and height. Let's, you know, maybe make this like a four by four. Yep, so we have a much smaller one and we can make this really as big as we want. All right. Let's fix the problem of it being off center. So really all we need to do is adjust the position of our camera so it's um, offset by half the size of our uh, of our board. So if this is a 32 by 32 game board, we need to adjust the position of our camera to be, I think, positive 16, positive 16, so half of that. Now notice here, it doesn't even fit because the game board's so big. This is where you might need to adjust the size, right? Depending on how big you plan on making your board. Um, but I'm gonna leave it at 16 by 16. And let's write the code to do that little camera offset. Um, so we can say, um, you know, here we can say like, uh, we'll do it before we update the board. We can say camera dot main dot transform dot position equals a new vector three. And our X, once again, it, it needs to be offset by half of the width, so width divided by two and half the height in the Y axis. And then the, for the Z axis, you just want to make sure that the Z is like, I think by default, it's negative 10. If we looked in our scene, it just needs to be offset a little bit. So, um, it renders everything, uh, properly. And so there now automatically, no matter how big I make our, our board here, it will be centered perfectly within our camera's view. So that looks good. All right. So that's a good initial start. Now let's go ahead and generate the mines. Let's go back to our game script. Let's create a brand new function here called generate mines. Oops. And let's call this function right after generate cells. Before this function, we should, well, first we have to determine how many mines there should be. So we could have another customizable variable for this where we can say maybe the mine count. Um, and for a 16 by 16 board, maybe there's 32 mines by default. But once again, this variable will show up in the editor so you can customize it and change it however you feel. This is just kind of our default. So for generate mines, we need to loop over whatever that value is. So if we say, um, if we say whatever the mine count is here, we want to loop over that many times and generate a new one each time. And for our mines, we're just going to basically pick a random coordinate and assign that to be a mine. We can say int x equals random dot range, where it's going to be a random number between zero and our width. And this is a class and function unity provides for us. And then same thing in our y. This one will be zero to whatever our height is. Finally, we can say state X, Y. So we're accessing the cell data within our board or within our array. And we can set the type of that equal to um, a mine. Now there's a problem here, which is what happens if you were to randomly get the same coordinates 
more than once. That could be a problem. It's not a major problem, but it's probably something we should account for. And so let's make sure we prevent, um, prevent multiple mines from getting the exact same coordinates. So we can check, uh, we can check if these coordinates already have been set to be a mine. Um, and then if they are, we can change these numbers to, to be different. And the thing is, um, let's see, it's possible, like, let's say these is already a mine. And so then we're going to update these numbers. Let's say we'll just move to the next, the next position on our grid. What if that one's also a mine? say okay well let's move to the next position what if that one's also a mine all right then we so there's it needs to it could potentially happen multiple times and so this is where we want a while loop because we don't know how many times you could potentially um, get coordinates that already are taken we just need to loop so while something is true we're going to keep updating these numbers until until it's no longer the case all right so we can say if this state if the cell at those coordinates is already a mine, so if the type is already a mine, well, then we need to update this. And we're going to continue to update these XY coordinates until this is no longer true. So while it is a mine, we'll update it. We can just iterate to the next position in the grid. So we can just update our X axis and move, kind of just move to the next space, basically. But like I said, well, what if that one is a mine? Or what if, um, what if you are at the very edge of the board you've hit the very edge well then we need to iterate to the next row we need to go to, we need to increment our y move to the next row and then set our x back to zero so we can say if our x is greater than or equal to the width you've you've sort of gone off the edge of the board and we need to loop back around to the beginning but move to advance to the next row but then since we're advancing to the next row, what if you're at the very bottom of the board and you've hit the you've hit the boundary there? We need to account for that as well. So we can say if y is greater than or equal to the height, once again, we need to iter we need to loop back around to the very top of the board again. And there we go. So just a little bit of kind of making sure that you know we're not running into any problems there. And that's it actually that's all we need to do for generating our mines we can't visualize this so just temporarily this is just going to be a temporary line of code so we can visualize it i'm going to say that these are all revealed just so we can see that they're all showing up and i'm going to get rid of that line of code afterwards so we run yep there we go we have everything let me update these let's reset this back to the default 16 16 with 32 mines perfect we could fill in all of our mines, so there'd be 256, and the entire thing should be full. It is. We could have one mine. It's up to you to customize how how you want this to be, you know. So I, I feel like 32 with a 16 by 16 board is a pretty good amount. All right, let me just delete that line of code before I forget, and then we can move on to the next section. So now that we have the mines in place, we can figure out all the numbers on the board. And the numbers indicate how many mines are touching that tile or that cell, right? So we're gonna look at all the adjacent cells and figure out, oh, well, there's four mines surrounding this one. So we need to set the number to be four. Let's create a new function for this. Private void generate numbers. And once again, we'll call this one right after all of that. And the order here is important. First, we need to just create ourselves. Then we can create our mines. And only once you have the mines, can you generate the numbers. So for our numbers, we need to just iterate over the entire 2D array. So I'm just going to copy these for loops. Like I said earlier, you're going to see these same two for loops show up a lot. Anytime we need to iterate over the entire thing. I'm going to pull out the cell data at those coordinates from our state. And then from here, we can figure out um, what number it should be. Now, if this cell is a mine, well, we don't need to do anything. We can skip it and move to the next one. So we can say if the cell type equals um, 
cell type dot mine, then we can just continue. This will just skip to the next iteration. If it's not a mine, well then that means it's empty. Um, now we need to actually count how many mines there are. And we'll set our number here, sell that number, right? There's actually going to be a bit of logic involved to count the adjacent mines. So we should probably put that logic into its own function. Let's go ahead and create a function for that. The function needs to return an integer for however many mines there are. So I'm going to maybe call this account mines. And let's pass in the coordinates of our cell. So we can say maybe cell X and um, you know, cell Y. All right, so our cell number is gonna get set to whatever the result of this is. Our cell X and cell Y is X and Y there. And let's go ahead and implement this logic. So the count of mines, we need to take a look at all of the adjacent um, tiles or cells and, and figure out, you know, like, so if there's a mine here, um, this is indicating it's touching three different mines. So this three number, this cell is, there's two mines there, they're already flagged. And then it actually implies that there's, has to be a mine here or, or I guess it could be in either of those. Um, but there's at least a mine in one of those, which would indicate this tile is touching all three of them. Um, and so we have to just look at all of the adjacent cells and determine is this a mine? If, if so, we'll increment the count, and so on. So for this function, we're going to start our count at zero. Initially, we're going to assume there's none. And we'll return that final count, but we need to do a bunch of stuff in between here. And so one of the ways we can loop over this is we need to look at all the adjacent cells. And we can think of these as, once again, more coordinates where um, the cell to the left will be x minus one, cell to the right is x plus one, cell above is minus one, below is plus one, um, etc. So we can actually set up a loop here to say, I'm gonna call this like adjacent x. And maybe this will start at negative one. So the left, we'll look at the left one first. And we're gonna iterate until adjacent x is less than or equal to positive one. So that's looking to the right. And this will just get incremented. And then same thing in our Y here. Adjacent, I'll just copy this whole thing. Change this to adjacent Y. So negative one is gonna look above it. Positive one is gonna look below it. And we're gonna iterate over that. And so now we can calculate the new coordinates by taking these two plus these, right? So our X is gonna be whatever our current cell position is plus the kind of offset you can think of these as like offsets so we're an offset by negative one right or positive one and then our y same thing in our y cell y plus whatever the current offset is now there will be one situation here where if one adjacent x is zero and adjacent y is zero you know the offset is zero so you're just looking at that current cell in which case we know already that it's not a mine so we can skip that one if the adjacent x is zero and the adjacent y is zero, if they're both zero at the exact same time, then that must mean we're on the current cell. We can just skip it. We can just continue. We don't we don't care about that one. We already know it's not a mine. All right. Given our new coordinates here, we can check if you know if that state, um, if the state of that cell is a mine so if this is cell that type that mine well that means we should increment our counter here and right, we're going to update our counter as it loops through and looks over all the adjacent tiles we will count how many there are and finally return that count at the very very end hopefully that makes sense um Oh, well, there's one other thing we need to worry about here, which is if we're on the very edge of the board and we're looking, let's say we're looking plus one. So we're looking one tile to the right of our current one. If our current one's all the way on the edge of the board, it's possible that these coordinates will be out of bounds. And if we try to access our states with some uh, coordinates that are out of bounds, we're going to get an error. 
um, and I believe you will get an index out of bounds error. We want to avoid that. We need to check. We need to say like if our X is um, less than zero or it's greater than or equal to our width, we're out of bounds. Okay. Or if our Y is less than zero or, or our Y is greater than or equal to the height, that means we're also out of bounds. We should just skip over that. It's not a valid tile. We can just, you know, if it's not valid, then we know there's nothing there. We can just skip it. So this is very important. If without this, you're going to get errors. All right, so let's go back to our generate numbers. We're assigning that count after calling our function. Um, and finally, we need to um, change the type of our cell. So if it counts, if it, it says, oh, there, there's three mines, we need to change the type here to number because right now it's set to empty. But we only want to set it to be a number if it actually counted something. So we can say if the cell number is greater than zero, then we'll set the cell type to be a number. Otherwise, it just gets kept the same. And finally, we need to just go back and reassign our cell to our state here since we've made changes to it. And now we are good to go. Let's test this out. Once again, just temporarily here, I'm going to mark the cell as revealed just so we can verify that this is working correctly. We're going to get rid of that line of code afterwards. Let it recompile. Let's run the game. Oops, we run that. Yeah, and this looks to be working. So we can see everything that has, everything's been revealed other than the mines. And we can see, yep, there's a mine there. There's two, you know, all these numbers feel appropriate. Yeah, here, this four is touching four different mines and it all looks good. Now we can even verify, let's, let's make, let's bump however many mines let's give a lot of mines we should start to see the numbers generally increase yeah we have lots of threes fours fives even some sixes looks good all right cool we set that back and let me once again let me delete that line of code before i forget get rid of cell revealed all right next we can start to add our user interactions so having the user actually be able to Click a mine, reveal it, or click any tile and reveal it, or flag tiles as well. So we're gonna need to handle user input. To do that, we need to add our update function. This is a function built in by Unity. It's gonna get called automatically every single frame that this game is running, or the script is running within your game. This is where you almost always handle input. So we can check, for example, if inputs get mouse button down and here we can provide an integer to indicate which button so zero will indicate left click one will indicate right click let's start with the right click for flagging and it'll be a little bit easier and it'll just help us get started here let's do one and i'm going to create a new function to handle all the logic for this so let's create a function called flag and we'll call that if the input has been pressed and so the first thing we need to do is determine which tile did you actually click on, right? And to do that, we need to get our mouse position, but our mouse position is in screen space. So we need to convert from screen space to world space, and then from world space to essentially cell space, or like our tile map exists in our scene within the world, within world space. But our mouse position is in screen space so we need to convert there and then once we have that world space position we need to figure out which individual tile did we click on and so there's a function to do that as well so let's just take a look at how this works so first we need to get the world space position of our mouse we'll just call this world position and we can use a function on our camera called screen to world point. So this is a function that converts from screen space to world space. We need to pass in the screen space position here. This is going to be our input mouse position. So this is converting from our screen space mouse position to world space. With that, we can then get our cell position. 
by accessing our tile map. And our tile map exists on our board here. So we can say board.tilemap.tilemap.world to cell. All right, so this is gonna convert from world position to cell position. And now that we have the cell position, we can get our um, cell within our array using the X and Y coordinates. However, there's a chance that it could be invalid because maybe you clicked outside of the, the game board, in which case this position won't be valid. So we need to verify that. And we're going to do this a lot where we're going to try to look up a cell given some coordinates. And so let's create a little helper function for that. We can create a function that returns a cell and we'll just call this get cell. And we'll pass in the coordinates that we want to get the cell at. Here it's going to check if those coordinates are valid. And just like we did before, right? So we did this check up here. Let's go ahead and just copy this. Um, although instead of duplicating that code, we can actually have another helper function that returns a Boolean and that just says is valid some coordinates, all right? And so using that if statement we wrote before, if it's, you know, essentially it's valid if X is greater than or equal to zero and it's less than the width and the Y is greater than or equal to zero and the Y is less than the height. If all of those are true, then those are valid coordinates. So here we can say, if these coordinates are valid, then we can return the cell at those coordinates. If it's not valid, we can't return null. We can't return null because this is not a reference type. It's not a class, it's a struct. So we actually still need to return a cell, but we need some kind of way to indicate that this cell is an invalid cell. Um, what we could do is actually go into our cell data structure, and maybe we can add a new type here that's called invalid. And we want this to be the very first um, value in our enum. We want it to be first, not last. That way, when we create a new cell by default, it will actually be considered invalid. And if you remember way up when we generated our cells, we set them to be empty. And so for the cells that we generate, they're, they are valid. But in the case here, when we create a new cell, it will be marked invalid. And because it's marked invalid, we can then look, we can check for that later on. Cool. And now that we have this little helper function, we can actually replace this or we can replace all of this. So instead of doing all of this, we can just say, um, get cell x, y dot type equals a mine. And once again, let's say these coordinates are invalid. It's just going to return a brand new cell and then it's going to use all the default values since invalid is the first type by default it will be marked as invalid in which case this condition won't be met because invalid is not mine and so we're good there everything works out all right let's go back to our flag function and let's get our cell here using our new helper function cell position dot x cell position dot y and this is where we can verify um oh and this is a mistake this should have been vector 3 int once again tile maps work with vector 3 int and so there we go no errors there now and this is where we can say if the cell type is invalid well we can just return we can just say, nope, we're done. We cannot proceed any further, All right? Assuming it is valid, we can flip the state of our flagged property, right? We can just set this to be whatever the opposite of it currently is. And that's what the not operator here is gonna do. If it's true, then it's gonna do the opposite, which will set it to false. If it's false, then it'll set it to true. And once we've changed some properties on our cell, we need to reassign that back into our state array um, at those same coordinates. Reassign the cell. And then now that our state has changed, we need to redraw our board. We can pass in our state there. There's actually one other thing we want to do. 
we only want to be able to flag a cell if it has not been revealed. So we can say if the cell is invalid or the or if it's already been revealed, well then you can flag it. And we're good to go there. So let's test all this out. Let it recompile, run our game. And so here I can right click to flag cells. If there's already one flagged, it will toggle it, right? So it toggles it on and off. If I click outside of our board, I don't get any errors. So we're all good there. So this looks to be working correctly. Now let's go ahead and handle the left click for revealing a cell. Go back to our game script here. Let's go to our update function and check for input of left click. So this is going to be get mouse button down with index zero to indicate left click. And let's once again, create a new function to handle this logic. We'll call this reveal. We'll call that whenever you press your left click. And initially we need to do the exact same thing we did for flag. We need to get the cell position. Um, and uh, we need to get our the cell at a given mouse position. So we need to, let's just go ahead and copy that just the same. And from here, we can also do a very similar check here where if it's invalid, then we just don't proceed. All right, so if it's an invalid cell, it was out of bounds or something like that, we just exit and we don't proceed any further. Now also, if the cell has already been revealed, then we don't need to reveal it again. So we can exit in that case as well. Also, if the cell has been flagged, you need to unflag the cell before you can reveal it. Um, so by flagging it, it's kind of acting as like a safety in case you were to accidentally click it. It won't do anything. You have to unflag it before you can reveal it. So we're going to exit in that case too. And then from here, all we need to do is set reveal equal to true. And then we update because we've updated our cell. We need to reassign that back into our state. We set our cell there using those same coordinates. And then we need to tell our board to redraw itself. We pass in our states. All right, let's go ahead and test this out. And we can click. So we got some empty ones. We got a couple numbers there. We got some mines. All looks to be working correctly. If I click outside, I don't get any errors. Everything's good. Now, obviously, I should lose if I click on a mine. So if I reveal a mine, I've lost. We're going to handle that logic um, in its own section. Also, when you click an empty um, cell here, it should flood and reveal all of the other empty cells surrounding it. Um, or just as, as much as it can, it's going to reveal all those empty cells. So we're going to handle that too. So let's go ahead and handle the cell flooding, which is when you click on an empty cell, it will reveal all the other empty cells that it's touching. And it kind of recursively does this as much as it can. So this is maybe one of the more complicated aspects of the tutorial that might be harder to grasp because um, we're going to use something called recursion. But I will try to explain it as best as I can. So if you reveal a cell and this cell happens to be a empty one, we need to do, we need to flood it. Um, so that's before I even execute this code, I want to check if the cell type is empty. And if it, if it is empty, I'm going to call a new function here. Let's add a function called flood and we need to pass in our cell to this function. And so we'll call flood here and we're going to um, pass in our cell there. So flooding, basically, it just needs to reveal if there's another empty cell next to that one, it needs to reveal that one too. And then for that cell, if there's empty ones next to that one, it should reveal all those and it should keep going and going and going as much as possible until it hits a wall essentially until it hits either the edge of the board or a number then it should stop and so this is a really good use case for using recursion recursion is when you have a function that calls itself so our function flood here 
it's going to call itself and pass in a different cell to flood. And so this is going to make it just execute this logic over and over and over again. And the important thing then is for recursion, you have to have some kind of exit condition. At some point it needs to stop because if it never stops, then you've just created an infinite loop of the function calling itself over and over again. And then you've just broke your entire application. Um, so that's the very important aspect is some kind of exit condition. So let's actually start there. We know we can no longer continue flooding once, um, a, well, if this cell has already been revealed, then we stop there. So that's one of our exit conditions. Another one of our exit conditions is if we hit a mine. Once we kind of hit a mine, then it stops flooding at that point too. Um, yeah, so let's write that. So we can say if the cell has been revealed, then we just stop. We just return immediately. We exit our recursion kind of loop. Also, if the cell type is either a mine or it's invalid, then we also want to exit the recursion. And the invalid here is really important because if the if it goes out of bounds, right? If the, if the coordinates are out of bounds, it'll be invalid and we want to exit. If these aren't the case, then we want to reveal our cell. So basically it's going to be the same two lines of code here. We want to reveal it just like we normally would. And then from here, oh, and we don't have cell. This should just be cell.position and cell.position. From here, we want to continue flooding if if it's another empty cell. Um, so if the cell type is empty, we will continue flooding. And this is where we're gonna call ourself. So this is the recursion happening where we're calling the this ourself, all right? We're inside this function, the function's calling itself. But we need to pass a reference to a different cell, right? So we can get the cell using our current coordinates but minus one, like, so the, the cell to the left of it, right? So same Y, but we're going to look at the cell X minus one. So to the left, we also want to flood to the right. Cell so position at X plus one, Y stays the same. We want to also flood downwards. So X stays the same, but the Y position, um, we'll do minus one and last one, L position X, L position Y plus one. So we're looking at where when we we hit an empty cell, we're going to continue flooding for all of the cardinal cells surrounding it. The one to the left, to the right, above it and below it. We're going to continue flooding and that's just going to cascade outwards and outwards and outwards until it hits these exit conditions. Until it hits another cell that's already been revealed, it stops. If it hits a mine, it stops. Also notice how... If it hits a number, it should also stop. That's not an exit condition though, because if it hits a number, we do want to reveal the numbers. We do still want to execute this code here. So it's going to reveal it, but then it's no longer going to flood. And so that's why we we kind of have another if statement. Instead of, instead of having an exit condition up here, um, we have a second if statement to check if it's empty and not a number. If it's a number, we still want to reveal it. We just don't want to flood anymore. All right, let's go ahead and test this out. Perfect. So notice how I clicked, I clicked this empty space here and it revealed all the other empty spaces that are basically touching that one. And it cascades outwards until it hits the edge of the numbers. And at that point, it stops. So it does reveal the numbers. Once again, it does it does um, reveal the numbers because there's no exit condition to say, hey, if, if it's a number, exit early. It still reveals it, but then it doesn't continue flooding. It stops after there. So that's exactly what we want. There, I clicked another empty one and it reveals all of those. But it's a kind of an important aspect of Minesweeper and one of the probably the most complicated part too. So nice job. All right, finally, let's handle what happens when you 
reveal a mine. It should explode and you should get a game over. So let's go down to our reveal function. And we need to check if the cell type is a mine. Now, I'm, since I'm already checking the cell type already, I'm going to just rewrite all of this using a switch statement instead. So I'm going to switch on the cell type. This way I can handle all the different types in one in one block of code here. So we can say if the type is a mine, we will call um, a new function that will implement called explode. We'll also pass our cell data into there. We'll call explode, pass our cell, and we break out of that condition. If it's a empty cell, we will flood just like we were before and we break out of there. So we're just rewriting this. This gets deleted. Um, just rewriting it to be a little bit simpler. If it's not a mine or an empty cell and we'll just handle it like default where we reveal the cell. And in all three cases, we always still want to update our board afterwards. So but just refactor that to, to, to write the code in a, maybe a little bit neater way. Um, since we're just constantly checking the cell type, this is just a more maybe straightforward way to write that, but logically the exact same. Let's go ahead and finish implementing our explode function here. Um, all right. So for explode, at this point, you've gotten a game over. So one of the first things I might want to do is indicate that the game is over so the user can no longer continue playing the game, right? We need to prevent them from, from clicking more things and so on. So I might want to just have a little variable to indicate that the game is over. Okay, so just a boolean set to true false. When you start a new game, I should set, oops, not game object, game over should get set to false whenever you start a new game. And when you explode here, that gets set to true. Also, just for the sake of testing, I'm going to add a little debug statement here just to indicate you've gotten a game over. We're not going to add any menus and UI for the tutorial. I'll let you all handle that however you want, um, cause there's really dozens of different ways you can do menus and stuff. Um, really just focusing on the game logic for this tutorial. So here we have a debug statement to indicate the game is over. Obviously you would probably want to replace this line of code and maybe add a line of code to display a UI menu or something along those lines. So when the cell explodes, we want to reveal it just like we normally do. We also want to set set it uh, or mark it that it's been exploded. because This is going to render a different tile. However, on that note, we actually never did that. So we mark it as exploded, but we're not, we're not really using this property anywhere yet. So let's go back to our board script. We I said earlier that we would not touch this again, but I kind of lied because we forgot one little thing. In the case that we're returning the revealed tile for a mine, a mine can either be just the normal mine tile or it could be the exploded mine tile based on this value being true or false. And so we need to check that. We can say we'll return um, if the cell is exploded, we will return the tile exploded. Otherwise, we'll just return the default mine tile. This here is called a ternary statement. It's basically like an if statement. So you're basically saying if the cell has exploded, if that's true, we will return this result. If it's false, we will return the second result. And right, so exploded is true. We return that tile. Exploded is false. Then we return to the default tile, mine tile. All right, back to our explode function. Now that we've updated our cell data, we need to reassign that back into our state. So it's at that same position that it's currently at. And then from here in Minesweeper, they usually reveal all of the other mines on the board, just so you can maybe learn from your mistakes and just kind of see where everything was. So to do that, we just need to loop through our entire array, check if it's a mine and if it is we'll mark those ones as revealed as well so the same four loops i've written uh, several times now for in x equals zero x is less than the width 
y equals zero, y is less than the height. We increment both of these upwards. All right, here we can um, reassign our cell variable to this new, um, to the new cell at those coordinates. And if this cell is a mine, then we will mark it as revealed. And once we change the cell data, we need to reassign that back into our state. So here state and the coordinates X, Y, just reassign our cell back into it. And there we go. This will just reveal all of the other mines. We don't mark the other ones as exploded. We only mark the one we clicked on as exploded. And so we'll know as we test the game here, the one we clicked on should, uh, it should render the exploded tile which is like, it has like a red background, whereas the other ones just have, you know, just are normal, so. Oh, also we, we can see here we got a warning because we added that game over variable, but we're not doing anything with it. So we'll finish that. Oh, first try, I clicked a mine. So we can see I clicked that one. That one's red, because that's the one they exploded. The rest reveal themselves. Let's run that one more time. We also got our game over in our console. There we go, got another mine, game over, it explodes, the others show up. So that's all working nicely. Um, let's go ahead and fix that warning we got that says, hey, you've added, you've added this variable game over, but you're not doing anything with it, right? And so what we meant to do is say, um, when you have a game over, we no longer want to allow the user to click on things. So we can just say, if you don't have a game over, then we can execute all of this all of this logic for checking input and so on. But if you have a game over, then you won't be able to do that. And that is it. That is our explode function. The very final thing we need to do is handle our win state. We just added our lose state. Now let's handle our win state. So how do we determine if the user has won? Let's add a function to handle that logic. I'm gonna call this maybe check win condition. And we need to call this anytime you reveal a cell that is not a mine. So our mines are lose condition. If it's an empty tile, we should check. Also, if it's just a kind of, um, you know, a, a different tile that just falls under this default case, we also should check our win condition too. All right, so in our win condition, we know the user has won the game if they've revealed every uh, cell that is not a mine. So we need to loop over all of our all of our cells. So let's write that. Um, it's four loops again. Y equals zero. Y is less than our height. Y plus plus. All right, I can't type very well right now. So if you've revealed every tile um, that is not a mine, that, that indicates you've won. And so we can take the inverse logic there, which is to say that if the cell is a mine, um, or if the cell is not a mine, but it hasn't been revealed yet, well, then you haven't won the game yet. And so we can first, let's grab the cell. Grab the cell at those coordinates. If this type of this cell is not a mine and it has not been revealed, that means the user still has something they need to do. The user still needs to reveal the cell in order to win, right? Once all of the non mines have been revealed, then you have won. So if at if any point, it, something has not been revealed, well, you haven't finished yet. And so we know immediately that you, the game's not over, we can just exit. We can just say, don't proceed any further. The game is not over yet. And so in essence, if you're able to loop over the entire, um, all of the cells in the game and it never exits, well, that means you have won, right? If it never exits, then you've, you've everything passed and you're good to go. At that point, we can say, yep, the user has finished. All right, so now we can handle what happens when you win. Um, once again, I'll just put a little debug statement here to indicate that you are a winner. 
I'm also going to indicate that the game is over. And by game over, I don't necessarily mean like you've lost. I just mean that the game is not in an active state any longer. Um, once again, this is going to prevent the user from doing any further inputs or anything. And from here, I probably should flag all the mines. Similar to how when you lose, we reveal all the mines. I want to kind of do the opposite where I flag all the mines. Because technically, you don't have to flag the mines to win the game. You just have to reveal. Um, you just have to reveal all the non-mines, but you don't actually have to flag them. Flagging is kind of just a, a a way. It's just a tool you can use while playing the game to help you out. But I'm gonna literally just copy this whole block here, and all we need to do is change this from cell revealed to cell flagged. And then I need to add that there. So if it's a mine, we will mark it as flag. Just once again, it's just going to kind of show the user where all the mines were. Well, at that, this point, they've won, so they kind of know where all the mines were, but we're just going to flag them all. In most cases, when people play the game, they flag the mines as they go. But um, yeah, we'll flag them just in case, just to help visualize it. And that's it. We are done. Um, one thing we might want to add really quick is when the game is over, maybe we have a, a key bind so you can restart the game. So in our update function, we can check for if input get key down. So this time we're going to check for keyboard, not the mouse. And we could say like key code, let's say maybe R for like restart. Then we can call our new game function again. And this can become else if if. All right, let's go ahead and test all this out one final time and play our game. I'm going to reduce the size of the board just to make this quicker. Let's say it's 4x4 four four with... Oh, here's something that's interesting. Actually, let's do this real quick. In the case that it's a 4x4, four four, there's only 16 squares. But my mine count is 32, so that doesn't make sense. There's a way we can restrict this value so it never exceeds um, the total. Unity has a function called onValidate, which is a function that will get called automatically in the editor anytime you update some of these values. You're validating that these values are valid, right? And so I can say the mine count here. We're going to clamp that. Clamping is a way to say it should only, the value should only fall within this range. So we're going to clamp the mine count between zero and width times height there can only be you know whatever width times height is and so now if we look real quick if i drag this to change i cannot go past 16 because my board is only a size of 16 so this just prevents me from mistakenly setting a value that wouldn't wouldn't work and let's just say there's like two mines here so i can just quickly run through one 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 there we go. So this is a mine. Um, this is a mine. This is good, good, and good. So yep, I won. There we go. Everything is working correctly. We do one more. This time I won't flag them at all. But I know, oh, this one I just have to guess. Um, all right, I got lucky there. So I know this is a mine, but I won't flag it. I know this is a mine. I won't flag it. This one is not a mine. As soon as I reveal it, the game will be end. The game will over be over with. Notice how they got flagged automatically. There we go. We have a finished working game of Minesweeper. I really appreciate you watching this tutorial, and I hope you learned a thing or two along the way. Give the video a thumbs up or down to let me know how I did. Subscribe to the channel for more videos just like this one, and leave a comment recommending what you would like to see next. If you want to support my work even more, you can become a Patreon member to receive exclusive benefits, including access to the unity assets that I develop. Link in the description of the video. Thank you for watching. See you in the next one.